Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment. Hello, and welcome to Champions of Psychology, a show with the goal of openly talking about mental health and gaming presented by Codename Entertainment and TakeThis.org. Every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time here on twitch.tv slash Games, or later on your favorite podcast service, normally Mitra Jordan and Rafael Bocamazzo, a.k.a. Dr. B, talk about mental health in these unprecedented times as well as how gaming affects us, but today we have a guest with us, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Kilmer. Uh, and uh, our topic today is going to be styles of play, but before we get into that, Dr. Elizabeth Kilmer, who are you? For the fine folks who Hello. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, like you mentioned, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Kilmer. I am a licensed clinical psychologist, and I do a lot of work with tabletop role-playing games, specifically therapeutically applied ones. I am the director of education and training for the nonprofit Game to Grow. Game to Grow is a 501c3 nonprofit that believes in the use of games of all kinds for therapeutic, educational, and community growth. In particular, we're most well known for our therapeutically applied games using Dungeons and Dragons as well as Minecraft. And we get to serve individuals from all over the world. We work with adolescents as well as adults. Additionally, we have a training program that is specific specifically designed to help mental health professionals, community members, and educators uh, harness the power of games. Heck yeah. I did not know about the Minecraft part. That's really cool. I, that's, I, I, mm -hmm. I, want, to, I want to look into that. And and who else is this mysterious stranger that we've never seen before in the window next to you? <laughs> I feel like trying to drop down into the lower part of the stream and like doing a Kilroy thing or something. I don't know. Just see if I can peek over. Just just right over. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you'll Mr. Wilson it. There we go. <laughs> Uh, but hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Rafael Bocamazzo, better known as Dr. B for long Italian name reasons. I am a non-practicing doctor of clinical psychology and the clinical director at what was the very first mental health nonprofit to serve the game community, TakeThis.org. I am coincidentally also an expert on the applied use of gaming in clinical and learning settings, which is incidentally how Dr. Kilmer and I know each other. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so, but again, hi, I'm Dr. B. <laughs> uh, also, I do want to put in real quick, yes, I realize that the video has become desynced once again. Audio listeners, it doesn't matter to you. Uh, I don't know why Zoom and XSplit hate this show, but not uh, Champions of Lore. I, I don't know, I don't know. I have no explanation. Gremlins are in the, blame the, me. the systems. Um, but no, uh, Dr. B is for broken. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not. It's, it's the, the B is like for the breaks right things. <laughs> um, okay, so topic today is styles of play. What what do we mean when we say that? Like, what what do we mean in reference to psychology? I really I because Dr. Kilmer actively works with people at this point. I want to defer to her on this. Mm. Um, so what styles of play means uh, is pretty broad, right? So we, as we were kind of planning for the episode today, we were talking specifically about the focus on like why people play and how the reasons why people are playing is going to come out in the way that they play. Uh, whether that is a focus on connecting with others, whether that is a focus on learning skills, whether that is is uh, trying to figure out whether or not you're safe in this group or what this game could even look like for you. Uh, those reasons why you play are going to influence the ways in which you play. Okay. Yeah, and there's um, those of those of you who have watched this this show before have probably heard both Mitra and I talk about something called self determination theory, and it's this idea that the hobbies that we choose, the actions that we take uh, by choice, they reflect 
various needs. And usually the needs that are talked about are connectedness. So, you know, social stuff, a uh, sense of autonomy, comp you know, competency, feeling that sense of empowerment, as well as uh, achievement. You know, do I want to do things? And Incidentally, there is a researcher by the name of Nick e, Nick Yi, and you can look up his stuff online. He did a paper in 2007 called Motivations of Play in Online Games that uh, analyzed essentially three major categories of why people engage in online games as well as three subcategories. And they're not dissimilar to that, uh, so, uh, that self-determination theory idea. The major categories he talked about were achievement, social, but it, uh, social stuff, but also immersion, just wanting to experience a really good story, mm -hmm. which is incidentally why I love single player RPGs so much. Mm -hmm. And also why I can't play them when I'm not on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Makes sense. I love stories. I just love good stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I love you, especially if you combine something that has both a um a resource management component and a really good story i need to never be near that game when I have work <laughs> to do, ever if there's building resource managing and a really killer story and like there's leveling i can do for my character and develop it yeah that's that's anathema to me ever getting work done uh, my 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 one like that is like destiny like games like the the games as service sort of thing like i uh -huh. i have a i have a huge problem like i i will see a trailer and it's like you can team up with your friends and fight in pve things and i see numbers popping off enemies i go oh no oh, <laughs> we no. own two playstations for that reason i love so it so i love I, it um like hadn't been like I hadn't been playing video games for a while in grad school my partner got me back into it and I was playing through some stuff in Destiny 2 and then I learned that you can play through the the missions co-op like you mm -hmm. can play through the story with your friends mm -hmm. and we went out that night and made the questionable financial decision based on where we were in grad school at that time to purchase a second PlayStation so that we could play through the missions together yeah um yeah, it's it is a good and dangerous. Thing. Yes, yes. Um, the uh, <laughs> and the... you're still together. <laughs> yeah, we have a do we have two? We now have a, a PS4 Pro and a PS5 because we finally got one of those and two uh, TVs in the living room. I love that. I love that. So my my uh, my best friend and his wife do the same thing. They got the TVs next to each other. My my wife and I we we did that at the beginning of Destiny One, but we had to be in separate rooms because like we would just uh, we 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 couldn't couldn't not focus on the other screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, but going back to to you brought up Nick Yi and, and the three things that you had there were uh, achievement, social, and immersion, and we talked yeah. about the uh, the immersion part of it. Mm -hmm. So. I like I the achievement and social thing, you know, kind of kick off with me for like why I love Destiny so much. Like I get to hang out with my friends, I get to have that feeling of achievement and stuff when I get a new exotic or you know complete a bunch of bounties and everything like that. So, what what does that have to do with what uh, Nikki was talking about? Well, I mean, you kind of summarized it there. <laughs> <laughs> I you're that you're, you're giving great examples well, right look, there. I, I'm just here to host. I don't know this stuff. I just talk. <laughs> well, Destiny is a great example, right? And it's structured in a way where you have clear objectives, right? Like mm -hmm. a bounty is a clear objective. Um, triumphs are a clear objective. Yeah. I just um, spent a, a couple of days grinding so that I could get a t-shirt for the fourth year in a row because I completed completed an, an, enough check boxes, nice. right? I'm sorry, you can get um, clothing for this? Yes, you can. Yeah, you can. <laughs> If you, you complete so, things fast so, enough, you so can there, get special clothes with your name on it. Yeah, there's a there's a moments of triumph shirt that they do every year. That uh, if you go to the bungee store without anything else, it costs seven thousand seven hundred and seventy seven dollars. But if you complete all of the triumphs for that uh, season, you get a code which then takes it down to like twenty nine dollars. Well, and like if you create, why, why am I not playing Destiny enough? anymore? Really oh, I'm terrible at first person shooters. That's why you. I will play with you. I, you. You let I'll me know. You. I I'm will play with you. Good. Oh my god! I just did my second raid ever. Um, we have not 
for me, but we have a couple of raid jackets headed <gasps> our way because there's you can, jackets. You can, there's ja- they're really good jackets too. They're okay, good. okay, we're gonna have to continue this conversation uh, <laughs> off stream because this could turn into why Doctor V should play Destiny for an hour. But uh, <laughs> going back to your idea, right? You have the B these, stands these for clear, bad idea. <laughs> you have these clear objectives. You you have the sense of achievement when you're completing those smaller objectives and the game is structured in a way where you get rewarded for just trying, yeah. right? Some of those objectives are be good at a thing, mm-hmm. right? But some of those objectives are just do the thing 10 times, yeah, right? And so you get this chance to practice and fail and the success criteria is not even necessarily related to succeeding in the activity. Yeah. It may just be participating. Some in of them are and I laugh and go, no. <laughs> Win seven trials you... missions. No, no, no. Wait, wait, yeah, wait, 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 wait. I can get a, a futility award. Yes. <laughs> just yes. for showing up and it, being yes. diligent. My favorite yes. bounty to a... ever read is play five games of Gambit. And I go, perfect. Yeah. I love Gambit, or I used to love Gambit. It's now a duration is just okay. Great but X-Men I don't have character. to pay attention. I can just play, I can be there, I can shoot stuff. It's fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we have a whole training on growth mindset coming out soon. And destiny makes it a big part of how how gaming can really uh, hold on let me guess uh dark souls destiny <laughs> uh d- d- tabletop rpgs thrown in there tabletop rpgs okay Three Witcher things 3. i don't shut up overcooked no. oh i haven't i yes that's gonna go in there okay you yeah, know you gotta throw it overcooked you sure. gotta you throw it over but um the, one of the one of the things in the immersion in the immersion part of nick Yee's taxonomy is this idea of escapism. And I, I want to touch on that for a second mm-hmm. because escapism, I, I think I've said this before on the show, but escapism gets a bad rap, mm. okay? Escapism in and of itself is neither good nor bad. But we, when we hear people talk about video games often or even any hobbies, really, it, it the word escapism is used pejoratively. Mm-hmm. And... I just, I I want us to get rid of that because distraction and escapism can be used really healthily. Mm -hmm. Just like any other behavior, escapism can be absolutely wonderful. I do it all the time. I want to challenge your, your idea that escapism is always used pejoratively because I don't know that escapism is when we're talking about things like books. Right. Mm-hmm. Like if we're thinking about like library advertisements, a lot of what they're talking about is like escaping to new worlds. Mm-hmm. So some of this has to do with our kind of societal expectations about what kinds of escapism are like good and okay and and worthy of our time and attention and good for our brains versus not. Uh, and so thinking like thinking about that, some of it is is better when we can better understand why we're engaging in games. We can better tie that back to, oh, well, this is some of the same kinds of positive experiences we're getting from books or the same kinds of positive experiences we're getting from other media, or the fact that this, these mediums, games are inherently interactive means there may be some parts of that escapism or some parts of that growth that we may not see from books Mm. because books are generally not interactive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Except for those awesome choose your own adventures I read as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Oh, choose your own that's adventures. That's what I say generally. Yeah, that's true. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, I I for me the the idea, maybe this is just me with the chip on my shoulder and how many parents I talk to about the, who who well talk at me really about video games. Um and the idea of when they're just escaping, they're just escaping. I'm like, no, no, Mm -hmm. they're actively engaging in a process. And yeah, they're distracting themselves because they're riddled, you know, they might be riddled with anxiety like some of us. Hi. Uh, (laughs) And being able to turn our brains off and engage in something that's just pure fun. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful from time to time. We we lose that often as adults. Mm-hmm. It's really important and restorative, right? If we're talking oh, about yeah. ways to avoid burnout, oh, and God, that yes. includes in personal careers, that includes in hobbies, that talks about burnout <sighs> if you are an advocate. Um, there's a lot happening in the world right now that if you, we, <laughs> I am a therapist, right? And so a lot of times what I talk about with my clients is how much are you watching the news right now? 
Because there's a point in which you are so plugged in that you are just like yeah. you are burning out. How often you're numbing are you hitting that explore that's tab on Twitter? Oh. Right. Like <laughs> it's it's there's a point in which being plugged in can become just as dysfunctional as being checked out. Yeah. Right. And so figuring out what that balance is to best support your needs, to best support your responsibilities is really important. Mm -hmm. um, so w one of the things that I know we wanted to get into, uh, we talked about the, uh, you know, styles of play in video games and stuff, uh, specifically Destiny. <laughs> um, I, but I know I, we, I didn't realize we were going to be talking about Destiny so much. But I wanna, I, you know what's actually funny? I'm wearing a Destiny shirt under this. I... Okay, now I suddenly want to play Destiny, and I've let's never, do I'm it. Not, that, yes. well, it. This tells you about that how differing our motivations for wanting to engage in things mm -hmm. can be. And for me, uh, again, growing up autistic and still being autistic, because you know it's not something you grow out of. <laughs> um, yeah, like but, every adult told me I would for ADHD. <laughs> oh yeah, no, 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 no. When you turn eighteen, suddenly your brain will, you know, not be ADHD. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting on that. That would be nice. <laughs> <That'd> be great. <laughs> I'm going to wake up one day, suddenly my brain isn't autistic, and it's going to be really distressing. Oh, God. The world is going to be so different. Um, but you know, I will, because, but, because you always talk about the window, Linux in a Windows world, you wake up one morning, you just hear, like, the Windows XP startup sound. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to be so distressing. It's going to be so horribly distressing for me. Yeah. Like a horrible nightmare. But I, I wanted to, I, I know we wanted to talk about the styles of play in TTRPGs, because um, I, 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 personally, I feel like that's the one that really gets the self-expression out there um so wh where do you want to start with this in terms of ttrpgs well i i think we can start off with recognizing that first of all everybody at your table every single person at your table and that includes your gms has different motivations for being there Okay, the GMs, I mean, we're not going like old school Freudian, they are a blank slate upon which to project your, your character. <laughs> they are an autonomous person with needs as well. Please, please be empathic towards your GM, because they have needs too. <laughs> and everybody has different reasons for wanting to be at the table. One of the reasons that like for me, I've talked about this in the past. I like to connect with people socially. I also love achievements, which is part of the reason that now suddenly I'm like, I can get a jacket for playing Destiny. <laughs> Let's talk about this. I can hang out with people, be terrible at a game, and get apparel? I'm down. It's a good jacket, but too. Every single person sitting around the table playing a tabletop role-playing game, regardless of age, regardless of what character they're playing, regardless of their role at the game, DM or player, they have a reason for being or reasons that are personal to them. So recognize that. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. The, um, the, there's, there is an interesting, uh, thing that I think does happen sometimes where there is a disconnect between thinking of the DM as a player or even as a person that is enjoying the game that is currently going on. They're a participant. They are. They absolutely are. Um, like, like to the, to the point that, like, I actually find it weird when they're like, oh, the DM is, like, you know, the, the DM is God. And I'm like, well, no, because, like, they're a player. Like, they still are doing things under certain rule sets. They have the ability to bend those rules a little bit more, but they are they are a player there. Well, let's let's talk about that for a second, and then I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Kilmer because I know she has so many cool and interesting things to say about this, and I want to hear all of these things. <laughs> um, the talking about the whole pl the DM is God kind of thing, um, that was brought up in the very first academic research that was done on fantasy role-playing mm. games that was published in 1983 by a guy named Gary Allen Fine out of the University of Chicago, and he talked about the idea that the DM is God. And that's true. He called he called the DM the referee because yeah. it was pan system. Um, but he said, yeah, the referee is God. However, there's a symbiotic relationship between the referee and the players because a God without believers is no real God at all. And so they can't act all willy-nilly and all tyrannical because they will lose their players. Yep. Everybody is trying to meet the needs of every other player at every other participant at that table. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, we can talk about the DM being God, but the 
they have to serve the needs of their players and vice versa. So there, yeah. there, there's but only anyway, been, there's only been one time at my table where I was okay with someone referring to me as the DM as God. And that's because a couple of my players were arguing with a call that I made. And my friend Kyle just leans over the table and goes, are you arguing with God? <laughs> <laughs> that's and an I, appropriate. I was like, that, okay, that was sure. really funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tabletop role-playing games are collaborative storytelling games with structured rules, right? Mm -hmm. And elements of chance, because that's what makes it interesting. Uh, and so the way that works is the GM is responsible for setting up the world and playing all those players, but playing all the non-player characters, but they can't actually tell a story by themselves because then they would just be giving a monologue or they would be writing a book, right? If you don't want anyone to have any influence on your story, that's totally fine, but mm -hmm. you should write a book. You shouldn't yes. play tabletop role-playing games because that's how they work. Um, they are a more structured, uh, for me, personally more comfortable version of improv, right? Uh, I don't do improv games very well. I get super anxious and uncomfortable. And so my boss likes to throw me into them for funsies as a learning experience. Wait, he does? People on the internet. Yeah. Oh we, my we gosh. Improv in our trainings and. There's some informed consent there. Yeah. There's some amount. I'm way better at it than I used to be. Um, but uh, tabletop role playing games like D&D &D and Pathfinder can be amazing because they can allow you to get to tell stories with other people without mm -hmm. the same kinds of pressure as something like an improv or um, kind of a narrative story group. Because you have these more structured rules, everybody's more or less on the same page about what the mechanics are. You can kind of lean in and lean out in terms of, do I want to describe what my character's doing? Do I want to act as my character? Do I want to add emotion and voice and, and body movements onto that? Um, and so you get a lot of in and out in terms of like how vulnerable am I willing to be? How expressive am I interested in being? How much impact am I willing or do I have uh, to give today? Mm -hmm. Which can really impact the way that your character is played. And kind of pulling back to the idea of play styles, it's important to have some amount of match, not a complete match because diversity makes the world more interesting and also your games, but it's important to have some amount of match with your players. If... I want to play in a game where everyone uses silly voices and we do ridiculous heists. I am not going to be, I'm not going to have my needs met at a table in which players don't want to use voices for their character because it's not something they find interesting or they don't feel comfortable doing that yet. Mm. Now they, it's, this is something that I, I wish more people considered when they assembled tabletop role-playing game groups is the relational aspect. Mm -hmm. Because if we if we think about our game-playing needs as meeting personal, uh, interpersonal, as well as intrapersonal, so between us and within us, needs, I, I think it would change the way a lot of folks, uh, a lot of folks approach the formation of their groups, that you need complementary needs amongst each other not necessarily the same needs but complementary needs and again the person running the game is a participant as well so they need to have complementary needs as well mm -hmm. if I, I think you brought this up yesterday dr kilmer that uh that the idea of playing like a really hardcore tension filled horror game at this moment in time is not something that's appealing to you. Me personally, either. Mm. I, I need levity. I need joy. Because so much of what I do for work, and also so much of what you do for work, is very serious. Not to mention the ongoing generational global trauma that is COVID. Yeah. I, I need levity. I need hilarity. I want to laugh. Absolutely. And I think we can get caught up uh, and this is really common in lots of types of games or interactions where we assume, and this is the thing that everybody's brain does, is we assume that if we want some things a certain way, that everybody else is also going to want it that way. Like the way that we perceive the world is probably the way that other people perceive the world. False consensus effect. Uh-huh. There, the, hey, there's the terminology. your terminology word of the day, everybody. When everybody some, whenever someone says false consensus effect. Ah! <laughs> so, <laughs> 
this is why we talk about things like session zero, right? Session zero is where we sit down and we decide what kind of game we're playing and what kind of rules that we're using and, and what it's going to look like. And it's totally fine for you to sit down in a session zero and say, oh, I like all of you, but this isn't actually the game that I want to play, mm -hmm. right? It is okay for you to say that. Um, I have done that before. I have gone in and I've said, I am really interested in playing with all of y'all in the future, but I don't think that this game is a good fit for me right now. So I'd like to play at some point when you're playing a different game or when I'm in a different place in my life, right? I have literally gone into games and been like, oh, this is a game in which we where we're all doing like narrative and social problem solving and we're not hitting anything with sticks. I don't, I, I just want to hit things with sticks right now. <laughs> right. And, yeah, and that's a, that's, that's a fair. totally that's fair. Choice. Hold on, hold on. Just right now. <laughs> I, I tend to play characters that have things like stabby, stabby lightning daggers and can call down. <laughs> See, I would have, I would have, I would have thought you had a great ax. <laughs> Um, I have a Warhammer right now. Okay. Um, and prior to that, I did a lot of like, uh, I was, I've done some rogues. I'm currently a cleric who's a, a Thunder Domain cleric and they're terrible at healing. And so every time they show up to like a new adventuring party, they just like hand out a bunch of potions. Cause they're like, you sorry in advance, sorry in advance, sorry in advance. Count on me to heal you. Cause that's not gonna happen. <laughs> I'm thinking about I'm thinking about the people that Dr. Kilmer and I know, per, you know, together and personally, because a lot of us live in the same geographical ish region. And um, if I'm putting together a, a table of people, I am mentally classifying Dr. Kilmer as most likely to Leroy Jenkins. <laughs> <laughs> That's accurate. Oh. Um, <laughs> is. Because I have to do so much in my regular life mm -hmm. to not do that, right? Impulsivity, I have ADHD. Impulsivity is something that I have and will always struggle with. And so for me, one of the things that makes my whole life more sustainable is figuring out ways in which I have uh, healthy and appropriate outlets for just being impulsive and not trying that hard or thinking too much about the consequences. But I know 100%. That's really I know 100% want my character Garlock to be in a game with you. <laughs> I'm very excited. Um, I could use some more d, d in my life right now. But it's really important for me to understand that that's the kind of, of player I want to be in my social games, right? I am not that kind of game master when I'm game mastering because I'm doing a job. And most of the time when I'm game mastering, Sorry, my dog is getting comfortable right oh, now. Oh, don't worry. No, um, people are love it. Yeah. People are already loving. This loving. is Badger. Yeah. Um, most badger, of the time badger, when I'm, badger, I'm badger. game mastering, I'm running therapeutically applied games, right? So I'm working with people for specific goals. Uh, I can be fun and spontaneous, but just being really impulsive is not going to fit. Mm -hmm. Now, I've also played social games with people who don't want to play with super impulsive characters. Mm -hmm. That's totally fair. Yeah. Maybe they work with a lot of people who are impulsive in their life. And they, they just want to break from that. Yeah. And so understanding that we're going to have different needs and different play styles is really important because me wanting to be impulsive and someone else not wanting me to be impulsive isn't necessarily inherently wrong. But if we don't have a conversation about it, we're all going to have a miserable time. Yeah. I, I usually give my players a heads up that, hey, uh, this may start off as serious, but it'll very quickly turn into a Saturday morning cartoon. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, let's take a real quick break to remind our viewers and listeners of our disclaimer, and we will be right back. Champions of Psychology is meant as education and entertainment. It is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling. Discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts. While we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment.
Okay, I definitely want to make sure I had I left that last note there because I, I cut it off at the beginning. I, uh, I got the full oboe effect in there. Uh, oh, <laughs> did you did you cut off? I did. Lauren's I realized I got to it. Oboe work. I, I hit the button too soon. Uh, oh. But it's fine now. Everybody heard it. Um, so uh, I know one of the things that we wanted to talk about in relation to this was power gaming. Mm -hmm. What what does that have to do with this? <sighs> okay, one of my biggest pet peeves of all of the internet all of the internet arguing that goes on around gaming mm -hmm. is the idea that there is a right way to play games no the right way is however you bloody well enjoy mm -hmm. it okay yep. and yep. the and like i i as a teenager and going into my early 20s that i had a game master who loved handing out magical items like they were from a Pez dispenser. In fact, I'm really shocked that he did not create some sort of magic, like a, a, a Pez dispenser of holding where we could just like poke, God, poke so cool. a dr Drist's plastic head and then <laughs> out comes an item. I don't know. Oh but my God. I want to, I actually want to knowing in his one. case, it would have been Minsk and Boo, but the... Oh. But I like the idea of pressing Driss' head and like uh, frost or uh, icing death pops out. <laughs> I just, I mean, anything really. And there were so many people when I've when I've told about that, they're like, "Oh, he handed out so many magic items to you by level five or whatever." And I just swear it's just like this. Oh yes, pinky out. Oh, they did what? Mm -hmm. And the it was so much fun. Yeah, and had really interesting consequences within the game because it turned into one punch man essentially mm -hmm. and there we were trying to find like existential purpose for our characters who by level 10 could pretty much knock out anything that came our way mm -hmm. and it itself created a really fascinating game dynamic that turned into much more of a social game mm -hmm. than any of us realized then, you know, hey, who wants a deck of many things again? Oh, I don't know. I have three. <laughs> it, and that was fun for all of us. Yeah. It started off with, yes, I want to hit things hard. And I know, oh, I knocked that one out too. Okay. Mm. But it turned into something really fun that we wouldn't have been able to do if our DM held to this idea that there's a right way to play mm -hmm. that there's a right time to hand out magic items there is no right way to do it and this idea of hating power gaming is a form of not too subtle gatekeeping oh for sure yeah and there are tons of games that have different like games in them right i don't know if y'all have played hades um oh, yes. it's an awesome game it's a video game there's more story after the credits roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that game's like halfway through by the time you hit credits. So, but like, I love that the developers are like, hey, you did a great job. If you want to stop here, here's a great stopping point. If you just really care about the super awesome story we've created with all of these amazing characters and we've done an amazing job of pulling from different lore, keep going. Right, but that, there's that piece. I need to play this. Oh yeah, uh -huh. you do. Demon Souls, you play through the game, you get the credits roll, and now you have New Game Plus. Or the uh, game doesn't look; it's different. It starts over, but you are still more powerful, and everything has gotten harder, and you have all your stuff. Or like me right? with so, Dark Souls, you buy a giant lore book to read infinitely about. <laughs> yeah. So there's lots of these different pieces. I actually, so I run a therapeutic social skills groups with 11 to 13 year olds right now. And um, the group, I inherited this group from another facilitator. And um, one of the players had designed a character that ended up, um, the way that they'd made some choices that they leveled up, they were mechanically uh, like motivated to just murder because then they could create cool zombie servants. And we're playing D and D. And if you want to, like, there, there, you can hit some things with sticks, right? That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But one of the things we're working on in that group is around flexibility. So if your one solution is, I just want to murder everyone I see because then I can maybe turn them into zombies, we're not being super flexible with that, mm -hmm. right? But the mechanics of your character are really reinforcing that you should just kill everything you see. So we'd worked with us some, and I kind of got to the point where I was like. I 
I kind of think the mechanics are a challenge here, but I don't want to say you can't have this character. So instead I bribed them and I said, Hey, do y'all want to go from level nine to level 20 and play as level 20 characters until you get bored. And then you get to create new characters. And, uh, they were very into that. Very, very into that. <laughs> I, I am interested and would like to subscribe to your newsletter. Was, well, all they wanted was to get more powerful and to get more magical items. And they, they wanted to be the most powerful. Mm -hmm. And then they got to level 20 and they were like, we are the most powerful. And they got to destroy a bunch of skeletons and there were some awesome fight scenes. And then they were like, oh, everything's easy now. Mm -hmm. I don't think we want this anymore. Yeah. I think that maybe we, I think, I think it was kind of cool when we struggled. I think it was kind of nice when we like had to work for stuff. I'm not saying there's not stuff you can work for at level 20. I'm not saying there's yeah. not more story. There absolutely is. Uh, but I was very intentionally creating a world. I'm just like, yeah, you just, you win every time really easy. And they're like, oh man, I guess it is valuable. Like when we get to to try and struggle, right? So I'm, I'm wanting them to, we're part of what we're working on. So it's building up frustration tolerance, like building up that willingness to keep doing things when it's hard. And so having that space where they were like, everything is really easy. They were like, oh, it turns out that can make things um, not as fun as we were having when we were struggling. So now they're all at level three and they still really want to get to like higher levels because then they get to do more things. And that's really cool. It's very exciting. Um, but they're engaging in a game really differently, mm -hmm. right? The goal is not just to like, get through this puzzle as quickly as possible. It's to like have fun, mm -hmm. right? We're not suddenly just trying to, to fast track it to the end because they've gotten to the end and they've realized like, oh, it turns out playing the game was also really fun. Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. So Dr. Kilmer, Dr. Kilmer. Yeah. You are telling me mm -hmm. that people's understanding of a game can change and <laughs> people's styles of play can change. And even, even... I'm, I'm struggling with this one. Their needs can change. My God. It turns out that people can grow and change over time. Hmm. I don't believe it. I feel like some sort of research needs to be done into this. I, I do not believe this. <laughs> <laughs> I should also point out, uh, Dr. B and I have done some great debates about allowing evil characters in our game. Uh, mm. Two of those players were evil aligned characters. And it led to some great discussions because one of the player, three three of the characters got knocked out by a trap. And um, the, the fourth character was like, I walk by them. <laughs> 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 what you doing with your friends bud the and this player said oh well like i i personally really care about them but i think my character like i think that what's in line with my characters i think my character would just walk by them yeah yeah and i was like man how do you think that's going to impact your characters uh like play with the rest of this group and he was like i don't think it's going to work very well that's why i'm designing a new character it turns out that evil characters have a hard time working with other people the, this is actually but he wouldn't have got he wouldn't have gotten to have that if i'd been like no you you can't yeah this, this is actually very relevant to idol champions recently actually because the most recent champion is prudence who is a uh evil aligned warlock from the ox venture stream uh and jane douglas talked about on last week's idol insights about playing an evil character in a group of good guys and it was really interesting it was a really interesting conversation with her talking about it um i i recommend people go uh check that one out yeah i i i haven't i haven't done evil characters in my group yet but it, it, dr kilmer I was... and i as she she is not kidding we've had many discussions about this <laughs> there have been panels about this loud public <laughs> arguing <laughs> Well, it's been debate. Hold on. Yeah, okay. In fairness, I think you deliberately invited me on that panel to argue. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a debate. It was literally <laughs> called a debate. But, about I, am not, I am not opposed. <laughs> I am not opposed to the use of evil characters in um in playing groups. I think that there uh, there needs to be considerations for the overall dynamics of of the player needs mm -hmm. and very often when people play chaotic evil characters they're basically just saying i do what i want and you know screw all y'all and Absolutely. that can work depending on the needs of the the players and the group i have i had one player way back when when i was still running weekly groups that 
he made the coolest lawful evil character ever. And we talked about this beforehand. The reason he was traveling with this group is because his lawful evil goals coincided with the rest of the group. And he became the foil that spurred the moral development of the group to essentially distance themselves from this character. And mm. there was a fantastic dynamic between all, between all of them because, you know, he was like, Okay, kill them. And they were like, no, we can't do that. And there ended up being this just really fantastic um, antagonistic relationship that made the group cohese together even more. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, th this particular player outside of the game, incredibly well-liked. Incredibly well-liked. Mm -hmm. There, it, It's totally, totally possible for totally possible for there to be evil characters that make a group even better absolutely but you're right the considerations are really important yeah for social games i most of the time don't want to play with evil characters in my campaign but i run a lot of uh therapeutic and therapy related games i do a lot of work with individuals who've experienced trauma um, who may have a hard time with establishing trust with other people i've done a lot of groups with veterans and a lot of the individuals that I've worked with have had really negative views about themselves. They've thought that they are evil or they've done terrible things. And so they're, they should never, ever be trusted ever again. And being able to design a character that they believe reflects themselves is really powerful because I've never actually had a client who I would describe as evil or unworthy of like love or friendship. And so being able to kind of play out that character and get to challenge, okay, you said your character was evil, but they just saved a, a bunch of children mm -hmm. and they lost a bunch of their stuff and there's no reward for saving those children. Mm which doesn't seem super in lot, right? Like we get to have these really awesome experiential spaces where I don't know if you've ever been to therapy and your therapist is like, no, you're a good person. And you're like, yeah, but you don't know me. And you're paid to say that, right? Like that doesn't necessarily feel good. But if your therapist knows you pretty well, or your therapist is literally getting to watch you engage in a world and then says, huh, that doesn't seem consistent with what you've told me about yourself, right? That can be so much more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but there is this space. Someone mentioned in the chat about like, that we're making this assumption that everyone is willing to like be cooperative and listen to the GM. No, that's not true. Um, <laughs> I, I have played games with people where I'm like, why are you here? And they're like, I'm here because my case manager hates me and I don't want to be here. <laughs> oh my God. I remember those. Uh, or I'm here. Uh, I thought you were going to be in suits. And I thought we we're gonna have to talk about our feelings and I am fully prepared to have a bad time. Like that's, that doesn't have some you know. dice. Yeah. No, that Wait, doesn't what? mean that you can't have ground rules. And especially if you're playing a social game, you should be able to talk about where are my boundaries? What are the things that I am okay with? What are the things that I'm not okay with? Um, there should be this basic assumption of respect. If someone says, I really want to play an evil character and everybody else around the table says, we really don't want to play with an evil character. That's an okay boundary to set. Mm -hmm. But having those conversations so that you can then set the assumptions and the guidelines together is really important because it's fine for everyone to have different play styles or different goals or different reasons of being in the group. But if we don't have conversations about what those goals are, about what those boundaries are, people are going to be miserable. And this is, this is something that I know you talk about on a lot of your panels. I've talked about ad nauseum, and this is partially my autism brain, but also as you and I recorded a panel about uh, being an autistic DM, you know, just last night, uh, the idea of setting a framework in which to collaborate is an amazing thing because it, it baffles me how many neurotypicals assume other people are going to understand what they're not saying <laughs> and how many miscommunications happen because of it. Now, in my case, it's often because people assume I'm saying I'm some uh, people assume I'm saying something I'm not saying when really I'm literally saying yeah. everything. Um, and they're like, but there's more to it. I'm like, no, there really isn't. <laughs> That's confusing to me. And so having that session zero and not just starting with that session zero, but having ongoing evaluative conversations about just how's this working out for everybody gives you that framework. 
well, under which you can kind of explore. Tabletop RPGs in game can support that as well, right? Like we're not saying you have to spend 30 minutes every for every three hours of game you play having a boring conversation oh God, about that boundaries, awful. right? Like that's not, I wouldn't recommend that for anyone, but being able, when we're playing a tabletop RPG, you are yourself and you are also your character, right? And so I can ask questions as a player or as a GM, I can say, hey, what, what is your character's goal here? What is your character thinking? What is your character's intent, right? That's, I can ask those kinds of clarifying questions if I'm really confused about what's happening. And maybe the player says, oh, no, 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 I want you to be confused. Like this is going to play out well. And as long as I trust that person, fine, mm -hmm. right? But that can help us create more space for clarifying questions that honestly should happen in more of our real life. And we should use coded language less because it causes problems for everyone and lets people be mean without mm -hmm. getting in trouble for being mean yeah. yeah well and you understand this you understand the safety and the boundaries around it i mean i one of the metaphors i like to use i like to think about with a, any good tabletop rpg table is that of, of a really functional movie set mm -hmm. okay and the dm in so many cases i mean if you're if you're doing with um if you're if you're using a system that doesn't have a GM, like, I don't know, Fiasco, which is a fun game. Um, very, very fun. It's a different dynamic. But in, in games where there is a DM or GM or whatever, they are the director of the movie. They are the screenwriter. They are the extras. They are the producer. They are the lawyer. <laughs> they are the executives going, mm, yes, that's not doing well in the ratings. <laughs> and it, <laughs> They are all of those roles, and the players are the main actors. They are the featured actors. And in any functional movie set, play a, a theatrical stage play, there needs to be trust between the director and the actors because the actors are there to explore the role, and the director is there to kind of keep them on track in within well, it's, that. It's specifically like a movie where I can't think of any right now. Um, but you know where they'll be like, oh, that scene was amazing. And then you find out later that that scene was mostly improvised mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because everybody trusts each other enough and they knew the characters enough that we just right. like let people run with it. Like that's what a good D&D &D game is. Yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, there's a great line from Ocean's Eleven where they just, it was Brad Pitt and George Clooney and they just ended up going off script and it was so good and they stayed in character that they kept I, it. I think it was the, uh, the you think we need scene. one more. I think it was that one that was that was improvised i was specifically thinking of the you've been working on that speech yeah had to oh that's rush. right like, yeah 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 yeah. The, that was brad pitt and george clooney just talking to each other and continuing on with the that's scene right but they that's had right. the freedom to explore but then you have other cases like stanley kubrick in the shining yeah where there was no not problem. trust and it damaged shelly duvall's mental health irreparably yeah yeah it did and there's a power in that trusting there. There's a power in that trust and safety in that trust. And this is why I'm such a big proponent of safety tools in session zeros. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and we've, we've talked a little bit about play styles, like why people might be playing or what they might enjoy. But one thing that we, we mentioned yesterday when we were planning that I, I want to bring out here. And it's something that we talk about in some of our trainings is it's important to think about who the game is for and who your audience is. Right. So if I'm thinking about if I'm streaming a game, right, and the goal is I am streaming for viewers, then I'm doing a performance. Right. And everybody around the table, our primary goal is entertaining an audience. And so both the players and the GM are going to make decisions and their play style is going to be reflected on engaging the audience. Right. So mm -hmm. we're not going to want to have a lot of downtime or lag time. Uh, we're not going to have a lot. We're not going to want to have a ton of like thinking time because that's going to not present well. It's not going to play well to keep people engaged. Well, if I'm playing a game with my friends, then we can get up and take snack breaks whenever we want. And maybe I have a, a dungeon that I have designed and I'm really excited and it's I have a lot of feelings about it. And so I only want to play with people who aren't just going to break that dungeon, right? Because I'm playing for me and with my friends. Or if I'm running a therapeutic game, my goal really needs to be focused on the players around the table, 
-hmm. If I'm the GM there, I don't get to have a lot of ego in there. And all of those are really valid ways in which we play. So for an audience, for ourselves, or for uh, like therapeutic or educational growth. But it's important to keep those in mind because if we switch between those platforms, one of the things that we see people struggle with is they will switch between those types of games, but their mindset about what is happening and where their ego should be and what should be happening doesn't shift. Mm -hmm. And that's just as important, that's an important kind of layer on top of those play styles. Yeah. Um, we are uh, reaching towards the end oh of the show goodness. here. Oh my yeah. goodness, we are. Yeah, we're, 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 we're almost out of time. Um, what? I, I did, I did want to uh, say one last thing, though, uh, because we told uh, Dr. Kilmer that we have said before, and she did want to make sure that we said it, don't therapize your friends at your no, table. Don't do that. No, don't do it. No, no. Well, don't, don't. Don't therapize your friends, but also don't treat your friends as therapists. So don't, if you're saying like, hey, I want to work on being less impulsive. And so I'm going to try and be less impulsive. That's totally fine. If you're like, huh, I'm really terrified of something or I have this trauma and I think it's going to replay in this game. So I'm just going to exposure therapy myself. Don't do that. That's not okay. Don't do that. Don't do that. Keep yourself Um, and your friends safe. Don't expect your DMs to be your therapists. No. (laughs) No. Um, I did want to get one question from chat in here. Uh, I do want to uh, say real quick, though, that uh, the person that uh, uh, talked about the research article, I will show them that after the show. Uh, and the person uh, asked me about the pronouns thing. That actually is a great idea. I should ha- have actually had everyone's pronouns in the uh, their, ty- their name thing the whole time. That's a great thing. I'm going to change that in the future. Uh, but the question is from Monkey House uh, and mm. says, how do you what? find Monkey House? <laughs> how do you find the style of play that works for you when the games you like don't love you back? Uh, I uh, no other friends that want to play the same games uh, and limited social chat that encourage that encourages finding new friends. Um, some of that is going to be finding new friends or finding new communities, but that doesn't mean like just sending out feelers on the internet, mm-hmm. right? That may mean most game stores. Uh, will run like new nights for people. And that can be, a lot of those are virtual. Game to Girl has a Discord that has people um, that that uh, will will start playing games. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are ways to find groups, especially if you have particular things that you're looking for. Like you want a group that uh, communicates more via chat and relies less on voice, or you have a group that, work, that uh, is willing to make sure that all of their, that you don't need to be able to see anything to play mm-hmm. the game. Mm-hmm. Um, you can do it, I promise. There are also a ton of Facebook groups. I'm not a huge Facebook fan, but there are a ton of Facebook mm-hmm. groups that if you basically search like D&D or Pathfinder and like whatever. So I'm part of like a women and non-binary individuals D&D group. Mm-hmm. Um, those can be great places to find safe people to play with. Yeah. Uh, and uh, one, w- there's one quick thing I want to address mm-hmm. in there. And this is something I hear all the time it's this subtle idea that just because you can't play with one group means you're not friends with them there are plenty of friends that i have in my life that their style of play does not match mine and there's plenty of other commonalities that we have yeah and that game is not the entirety of our friendship it's not the only facet in there and so um I, i i would just challenge folks to separate that out that there are plenty of reasons to be friends with people often outside of the games um if the only thing you have is the game how close is your friendship yeah no a game can be a great way to start and develop yes. friendship. Mm-hmm. absolutely but, yeah absolutely but if it's the only thing you especially have especially because it's normal for people to like i will get really into games for a while and then not play them for a while mm-hmm. and so if there are friends um that aren't super close friends but they're friends and i will like every time i log into that game i get to see them and that's awesome yeah but we don't connect a lot outside and that's okay I uh, I want to throw in uh, there for the uh, video game side of that that that's okay uh, for like loving liking a game that doesn't love you back. I loved Dark Souls for years before I beat one. Years. <laughs> I bought every one of those games, fully acknowledging that I was not going to finish it. I was going to play it and do my best, and I was going to enjoy what I saw of it. Uh, but then I finally did beat it. Uh, but yeah, there's plenty of games that I that I have that I'm like, yeah, I really love this game. It is not my style, and it hates me. But I still occasionally go back to it and be like, hey, how are you doing? And it just punches me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like being punished the, right now. I haven't played any of the Souls games, but we just got the PS5, and so I'm starting the remastered Demon Souls, and it's so good. And oh, so, it's so, so hard. It's so pretty, but I, I can't I can't do Demon Souls. Like I've tried. My partner I has already uh, beaten it once. He's on New Game Plus now, oh, and I I'm gonna I'm gonna get there eventually. My my, my I need to play them, don't I? 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We 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 got some we got some video ideas that are coming out of this episode. Uh, <laughs> but I think uh, I think that is all the time we're gonna have this week uh, for discussions. Uh, uh, Dr. Kilmer, Dr. B, uh, where can people find you uh, if they would like to do so on the internet? Yeah, so uh, I believe my Twitter handle is here. It's a shared handle with my partner because we're both doctors. We're not on Twitter a whole lot. It's way better to find us at Game To Grow. You can find that at Game To Grow.org. You can find that uh, on Twitter at Game To Grow. We have a couple of groups that are uh, that we have spaces because we're expanding again. So we serve people all over the world. So if you're interested in joining a Minecraft or a D and D group, you should check out our website www.gametogrow.org. We also run training for mental health professionals, educators, and community members. We have an on-demand training for mental health professionals and a live one starting in September. They're and awesome. Uh, we will be around also with Dr. B at uh, PAX West virtually because yep. the things are happening. So mm -hmm. yeah. Right there. Um, Dr. B, you can find your me. Your bow tie is still tied. Oh my God. I, we, oh, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Good. I, I could I couldn't let a, an episode go by where no, you didn't I, do the No, I I would have felt terribly. I would have uh, felt terribly if I didn't you know t ritualistically take off uh, untie the bow tie. Um. I, most of the stuff you can find I I do is at takethis.org and on all the socials at takethisorg. If you're looking for me personally, my handle is below the Dr. B, T-H-E-E, D-O-C-T-O-R, B as in boy. Uh, you can find me on, well, here every week at 11 a.m. You can find me on the Twitters. You can even join me four times a week for a body doubling chill study session on my Twitch channel. And I cannot it's recommend just, it enough. It's chill and we hang out and hold each other accountable to doing the stuff we need to do. I, I hung out in there while editing Black Dice Society over the weekend and it was really, really nice. <laughs> 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 Got good lo-fi going. Uh, that was great. You can uh, find me uh, on Twitter at the Trevor. There's an A hiding in there as well as the pod, uh, Difficulty Class podcast every Friday and Champions of Lore every Wednesday here on Twitch.tv slash CME Games at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, also, this weekend, uh, I am doing a, uh, a fundraising stream with Lee Goldberg of Griddle Champions fame, uh, doing a fundraiser to uh, help raise money with uh, uh, for his big move that he's got going on. So uh, it's going to be on my Twitch channel, Twitch.tv slash the Trevor. Again, A hiding in there. Uh, thank you to Jay for moderating in the chat as always doing a fantastic job thank you to Codename Entertainment Take This for giving us an opportunity to have these discussions uh, if you missed any part of the show you can listen to it later on your favorite podcast service at 2pm and if you have any suggestions for future topics you can send those into Champions of Psychology at CodenameEntertainment.com uh, for those of us uh, for those of you live with us right now uh, as a heads up Bardic Inspiration is postponed today uh, so uh, they'll be back next week with new music uh, so uh, yeah we'll, we'll see you live tomorrow for Champions of lore but until then uh, until next week take care of yourself bye champions of psychology is meant as education and entertainment it is not a substitute for medical advice or professional counseling discussion of mental health topics will be primarily rooted in research and the personal experiences and self-disclosures of the hosts while we can provide generalized education and possible mental health resources, we cannot offer any recommendations, advice, or opinions for any specific persons, cases, or situations. We provide these resources and links at our sole discretion, but have not necessarily vetted or reviewed any resource. We assume no liability for the use of the information or resources on these sites, and we encourage you to use your own best judgment.